Well, I, uh, my name is uh, Greg Cox. I'm from uh, Bar Harbor. Cox. Cox, C-O-X. Uh, I teach at College Atlantic down there. And um, I appreciate very much the opportunity to be here and, and uh, talk with you all. Uh, and the opportunity for voice that you're all giving. This is a dark season and uh, dark times in many ways. And this room is so light and open and spacious and people have made a place for voices to uh, be expressed in a very main tradition, like a town meeting or other contexts where people get together and share their views. I, I really appreciate that and value it. And I, I mention that especially because I think it's emblematic of part of what we think of as the way life should be. And that is, in fact, in th a threat insofar as the ISDS and other sorts of procedures will be used to decide things that would be better left to towns and states and national legislature. Um, the, uh, I'll sk sk try to abbreviate some of my remarks, but read so that I don't get caught up waving my hands and talking too much length. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the issues at stake here cross party lines. They invite us to stop thinking like Republicans and Democrats because of this. We need to think like Americans and Mainers. We have to think in terms of the whole because this is a treaty that will change our whole relationship with the Pacific Rim and more importantly with the systems of governance that we have developed over the last 400 years in this land. Um, I would uh, like to begin my comments by reaffirming uh, the opening paragraph of the December 1 comments that Representative Treat um, had in her uh, summary of key issues in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I won't reread them even though I like them very much but since you're all familiar with them I, I'll cut that short. But the, key point that, that um, the comment concerns the ways in which the proposed agreement will, in key ways, effectively give up the sovereignty of our federal, state, and local governments and pass it on to a system of committees dominated by corporate interests. People who are advocating for this treaty and the transformations it will bring in our governance systems will tell us that it's about three things, three things that frame its importance and value. They'll say it is first about whether we want to have a rational economic policy that follows modern economic theory in advancing our national economy as a whole by seeking benefits of trade in what are called comparative advantage. Second, they'll tell you that it's about whether the Pacific Rim economies in particular and the world economy in general are going to be dominated by the Chinese or by us. And third, they'll tell you that it's about whether we want to pursue development as a free market, capitalist society, or promote the government regulations and interventions of a socialist society. And each of these three ways of framing the issue, I think, are fundamentally mistaken. Regarding the first, um, the theory of comparative advantage, like the Newtonian physics that was believed at the time that David Ricardo developed it, holds true in some circumstances, but not others. The basic theory of comparative advantage suggests that each country is better off if we specialize, producing whatever our natural resources, capital, and labor best fit us for. But first, it's crucial to note that the comparative advantages are often to corporations, not to average citizens. And when the comparative advantage is that they have lower taxes because of no health care, education, workplace safety, or because they have less regulation and can pollute then these are really only plutocratic, extractive, comparative advantages, not democratic, sustainable ones. The point about sustainability bears emphasis. Monoculture and other forms of specialization for the sake of comparative advantage are only beneficial when and if our overriding national aim is extractive and cumulative. If the aim is sustainability, then each country is better off diversifying and connecting locally regenerating and developing good relationships within its borders. So I want to suggest that the rhetoric about comparative advantage is something that should be called into question. Um, the theory of comparative advantage and the relentless pursuit of economic growth that is coupled with it is designed for an earlier age, a prior age when there was no need to worry about the carbon footprint of transport and the threats of climate change and the destruction of habitat around the world. As a teacher, I see my students at College Atlantic very concerned about climate change. And they go to work on 
food systems issues and local uh, gardening and farming. They go to work on transportation issues. They go to work on solar power and energy issues. They go to Paris. There are a bunch of them there now trying to push, as they have it at the uh, annual conferences of the parties on the treaty about climate change, to try and get something passed meaningfully, a treaty that's been in negotiation since before these kids were born. And the, the TPP drives our economy in exactly the wrong direction for dealing with climate change. Are we better off specializing and making only what we can, given the current international market conditions make the most money at? Giving up the ability to be self-reliant in the production of food, fuel, and other of our necessities? So again, it's, that's the key idea behind comparative advantage that we would be. But in fact, just reframing the issue in these terms lets us hear the voices of Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thomas Jefferson, Sojourner Truth, and a crowd of other proud and self-reliant forebears calling out self-reliance. We should not allow any treaty to strip of us of our abilities to provide for ourselves, come what may, and govern ourselves with local, state, and federal policies that promote just such economic security and freedom from dependence on faraway suppliers and unstable international markets. The question is not whether we will sacrifice comparative advantage for special worker or environmental interests. The question is whether we will sacrifice economic security and sustainability for special corporate interests. What of the second point? When advocates for the treaty argue that it will help prevent China from dominating the economies of the Pacific Rim and the world, we should reply that the issue is not which country will dominate some region of the world. The question is which economic system will govern and dominate us? Will it be one of our own making? one we can remake as needed to adapt to not only new technologies but new cultural trends, changes in our population, and advances in our moral insight like those that came with civil rights in the 60s, the women's movement in the 70s, and the Americans with Disabilities Act in the, in the 80s. As Mainers, we should not be worried about whether China is selling more objects of plastic, metal, and foodstuffs in Vietnam than we are. We should be worried about whether we can produce and consume here in Maine the kinds of things we think that we and our children should have. Can we make Maine be the way life should be or not? That's the question. What power do we have over our own lives and communities, regardless of who is the top dog currently in whatever international trade competition you might care to bet on and speculate about? What is the third point in which the advocates for the treaty tell us that is the question of whether we want to pursue development as a free market, capitalist society or promote the government regulations and interventions of a socialist society. This simplistic contrast between capitalism versus socialism is a false dichotomy. Every economy on this planet is a mixed economy with voluntary exchanges and markets of many different kinds and with government playing a crucial role in framing the context of those markets, the rules of property, the public infrastructure that makes trade and economic growth possible and that makes it sure that it promotes the public well-being. Every society is a mixed economy. It's a political economy. The question is, will it be controlled by a few or by the many? Our political economy in the United States is increasingly controlled by the few. It's the particular kind of oligarchy classified as a plutocracy, where the few who are most wealthy exercise the most say in how our political economy works. The TTP, with its centralized undemocratic principles and processes for implementing them would push us even further in that very wrong direction. Here again I would highlight, but I won't quote now, the remarks of Representative Treat on uh, the private legal system just for corporations that is being developed. The people like Maine, of, of Maine, like those of the rest of America, fought and died in war after war to secure freedom for themselves and others, the freedom to govern themselves, and not be governed by the interests of foreign sovereigns and corporations. The First Nations of the Wabanaki, who were here first and are still here now, have cherished the lands and waters of this region and the way of life they developed here as independent sovereign communities. And the others who have joined them in living here join them in cherishing those same values, seeking to secure for all who live here 
throughout this dawnland of the Americas, exactly those values. The peoples of Maine have worked day and night hard from one season to another, year after year, down through generations, straining their backs and freezing their butts and pushing themselves hard to make a life for themselves and their children the way they think life should be. Not the way some international rule or corporate lawyer or committee of three in an ISDS thinks it should be. The people of Maine have done their duty paying taxes and going to town meetings and serving on warrant committees and wrestling with referenda and driving down to Augusta and arguing painfully at times with friends and working out painfully also at times shared solutions with political opponents in order to fashion a system of governance for our communities and our political economy that suits us and expresses how we think life should be. If my mother was still alive to have her say about this, I'm sure that she would say that she would be damned before she would let some TPP come along and tell us how our life should be. I'd like to thank you all again for the opportunity for us to share voice in this kind of way um, and express and live out the values that we hold dear and that are part of the way we think life should be here in Maine. Thank you very much. <laughs>